Hey guys, my name is Jeremy, and I am the family pastor at the Sutherland campus. And I have a question for you. Have you ever been in need? I don't mean in want. I think it's easy, like we've all kind of been in want, but have you ever really been in need? At 19 years old, I was dating this woman that I wanted to be with for the rest of my life, Nicole. And I asked her to marry me, and she's like, sure, let's do this thing. So I was like, all right, let's, let, let's figure it out. And so um, I was in this weird place at 19 years old. My parents made too much money for government assistance while I was in college. And I and my parents didn't make enough money to help me kind of on a personal level. So I was kind of in this weird flux. And, and so I was like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push pause on college because then I can get a job and start saving money for the wedding as well as marriage. Well, at the time I was living in Eugene and the job economy at that point wasn't very great. And so I was looking, couldn't find anything. And so Nicole's like, hey, how about this? How about if you go back to Iowa, live with my parents while I finish out my freshman year here, and you can go back there and you can work and get a couple jobs and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, I think, I honestly think that's the best thing for me. And so on April, or excuse me, on January 10th, uh, I loaded up whatever I had, which wasn't much at 19 years old, college kid. I loaded up everything I had and I set off for Des Moines. And I had $200 on me. That's all the money I had. And so I, I left. It was just me. And as an extrovert, 36 hours alone in a car is like death. And so uh, I spent a lot of that time just praying, just uh, listening to worship music, singing. Um, I'm not the best singer in the world, but I had a chance just to sing as if I was. And so uh, it was a great time connecting with God on a deeper level. And it was 36 hours with, that I'd never had at that point with my Lord and Savior. Well, I had $200, and I only had so much money for gas and so much money for food. And I remember when I hit Green River, Wyoming, and I pulled in, it was in the morning time, I pulled in to get something to eat and get some gas, and I sat down at Burger King just to kind of have a minute, just to kind of get ready to go again. And I'm sitting there, and there's this man across the restaurant that's just looking at me. Now, when I was 19 years old, I looked like I was 14. No kidding. I looked like I was 14. And this guy just kept looking at me. It was kind of creeping me out a little bit. And he gets up and he walks over and he has his tray of food and he gets on the or something. And so he throws away his, his garbage and then he gets in his car and he leaves. I go, okay, well, that was good. Not, you know, that was weird enough. And so um, about five minutes later, the guy comes back again. And he gets out of his car and he stands right next to my booth. And he's like, can I talk to you for a minute? Now I'm like creeped out times 10, and I was like, Sh uh, sure, and he's like, you know, at my church this weekend, our pastor was saying that, look for ways to bless people this week, and for whatever reason, at this exact time, I feel like God wants me to bless you, and he gives me this envelope. Inside the envelope was $200, and it just blew me away that God was, was blessing me when I had no idea that I need to be blessed. I, well, I knew because I only had $200, but I was like, this is amazing to be a recipient of something like that. Well, I, I set out again, and I, I ended up in Grand Island, uh, uh, Nebraska. And Nebraska, it's not grand, and it's definitely not an island, but I pull in there for dinner, and I kid you not, the exact same thing happened again. A man saw me, walked over, and said, I feel like God wants me to bless you and gives me $200. And the cool thing with this story is, is I knew I, I, God had something for me, and, but I just had to step out in faith and trust that he was going to do that thing. And he did. He showed up. Um, today, we're going we're gonna to look at one of the crazy statements that Jesus, is make, that Jesus makes. He says this, I am the bread of life. And if you have your Bibles with you, if you want to flip to John 6, that's where we're going to kind of be hanging out today. Now, in life, in, in today's world, as well as in biblical times, I think there's kind of three different types of people. 
there's one set of people that we call them the fans, okay? So these are the people that are there for the fun time, there for the gathering, there for maybe some free stuff you may or may not get, but just there because it's fun. And then the church world, they're the type of people that are there because we want to be around Christian people, like-minded people, maybe people that are kind. They have kind of a, this, this goal in life to love God and love others and those kind of things. So they're kind of, that's kind of the fan group, okay? So that's one set of group. There's another set of people that I would call that they are the faithful-ish kind of people. These are the people in the sports world where they're the fans of, like, they love this team. As soon as that team doesn't do so well, they're going to jump to the new team. And, and that team does well. And then when that team doesn't do so well, then they jump to a new team. They are faithful-ish. And in the church world, those are the types of people that they kind of, they're there until they're asked to do something they really don't want to do or don't feel comfortable to do. And then they jump ship to maybe another church or maybe to another, like, friend group or whatever. They're faithful-ish. And the last group are the followers. Now, as a Cub fan, I am not a fan. I am a Cub follower. Uh, the Cubs have been terrible forever, and then they got good, and now they're terrible again. I am a follower of the Chicago Cubs as well as the Chicago Bears. They're just terrible, but I follow that team. And in the church world, these are the types of people that no matter what happens, this is my church. This is my community. This is where God has called me to. And so in this story, there are three types of people. Now, in John 6, it is a big chapter. There are 71 verses, and so we're going to kind of look over a few of those uh, 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 stories in John 6, and we're going to kind of land on one area. Uh, but in John 6, the beginning of it, Jesus feeds 5,000 men. Of course, there are women and children there. Some scholars believe there was about 10,000 people there, but he feeds all of these people with essentially just kind of a basket of like a, a fish sandwich. And Jesus just continues to bless it. And, and what he does, he gets the food, he, he blesses it, and then he starts handing it out. He breaks it apart, hands it out. And can you imagine if you're there and you're watching this happen, like Jesus from, from a little basket is blessing uh, all of these people with it. Just kind of a cool thing that happens. And so Jesus then goes and spends some time on the mountainside after this had happened, and he tells his disciples to go on ahead and go to a town called Capernaum. And so they head on out, and shortly thereafter, Jesus meets up with them in Capernaum. The next morning, the crowd of people wake up, and they realize Jesus isn't there. They get in their boats, and they head on over too. And they eventually find him teaching in a synagogue. And that's kind of where we'll pick up the story. It's in uh, John 6, starting in verse 25. And go on to verse 35. So I'm actually going to read 10 verses out of the Bible, straight from the Bible. It's crazy talk, I know. But in John 6, starting verse 25, it says, When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For, for on him God the Father has placed a seal of approval. They asked him, what must we do to, get these, to do the works God that requires? Jesus answers this. I love verse 29. Jesus says this. The work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to circle verse 29, point arrows at it, highlight it, do whatever you can. Jesus answers, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Going on in verse 30. Uh, so they asked him, what sign then will you give me or give us to see it that we may believe in you? What will you do? And they go on, they said, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then says to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave uh, or who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Two more verses. They said, sir, always give us this bread. And Jesus answers and he declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Will never be thirsty. So from this, this, this passage, we're gonna kind of break this down into three separate things. Number one, 
is manna. Number one, manna. Uh, out of Exodus 16, verses 3 and 4. Now, before Jesus was here on earth, there was this group of people called the Israelites. And the Israelites, they were slaves in this country called Egypt. And Moses, who you may have heard of, Moses came over there. He was, let my people go after uh, plagues had happened, all this kind of stuff. Pharaoh finally releases him. And so now they're traveling from Egypt to the promised land. And they're traveling in a desert for 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 months and, and eventually for years and, and all this time. And so eventually they're like, you know, Moses, I'm, get, I'm getting a little hungry. You know, can, can you help us out here? And so this is what happens in, in uh, Exodus. Uh, it says, the Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Thank you, Israelites, right? Uh, Verse four, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. Here's the thing with manna. Manna lasted for one day, okay? So manna, this bread from heaven, would fall from the sky, and in the morning they would come out and they would gather just enough for the day, whatever they needed for the day, and bring it back to their home, and they could have it. If they would try to kind of make it last more than a day, that manna would actually be swarmed uh, with maggots, or it would just kind of wither away, and so it was just not useful. Now, there's nothing wrong with manna. It came from heaven. It's got to be some good stuff. But the only other option, or the only other time where it could last a little bit longer was on Sabbath. So the day before Sabbath, so on Friday, they would, uh, the Lord would rain down uh, bread from the sky. They would go out, they'd get what they need for, for those days, and they bring it back. See, there was nothing wrong with manna. And manna, t- they say it tasted like honey. It was a sweet kind of taste. Can you imagine any food from heaven? It had to taste great, right? And so that's what manna was. So there was nothing wrong with manna, but manna was a blessing from God. That's what manna was. Is manna was a blessing from God every day. Now, in your life, you have many blessings from God, I'm sure. And sometimes we're blessed so much that we kind of take things for granted. For me, I'll just speak for me, I've been blessed with an amazing family, with a wife that loves me, that sees me, and only me. Um, I, I, I have a job that I love to do. I have kids that are great sometimes. No, they're great all the time. But, but I have kids. I'm blessed with kids. I'm blessed with, with a home. I'm blessed with some amazing friends. You see, these are all good things. These are all blessings that the Lord has given me every day. But the problem is, sometimes we spend too much time on uh, an energy and effort on the things that just don't last. We spend too much time on some good things and not on the best thing. So my question for you is, or one of the questions I have for you is, what is your manna? Meaning, what is a blessing in your life? And a blessing in your life that takes too much of your time, energy, and focus. What are some things taking place of the best thing? Now here's the flip. Even though uh, bread is good, even though it was what they needed, manna was a temporary supply for an ultimate purpose. Did you hear that? Manna was a temporary supply for the ultimate purpose. And that ultimate purpose was trust in God. Trust that he's going to provide for them every day. He's going to give them the things that they need, the the supplements that they need, as well as the blessings that they need in their life. They needed God. Manna was never made out what they thought it was. You See, I love this. Manna is bread for the day, but Jesus is bread for the day. For life. Jesus is bread for life. The point of manna was, was placing the point of manna was placing their, their trust in God. And they so lacked trust so much so they were like, you know, I know that we were slaves in Egypt, but we'd rather go back there because at least we had some things over there. But by Jesus saying, I'm the bread, he's not only the provider of physical physical needs, excuse me, but he also satisfies our needs deep within us. You see, Jesus satisfies the things that we're missing. He satisfies the things that we need. He he is always, always there. In those moments where it feels like we're all alone, he is always there. He's guiding us. He's whispering to us. He's loving us when we feel so scared. 
Secondly, bread. Bread, okay? So this is where Jesus makes that bold statement. He says, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, right before he makes this bold statement, they want another miracle, right? I mean, like, miracles are cool. Uh, it would be cool to see Jesus do that with, like, a fish sandwich, right? It would be so cool to see that. And so they're like, you know, if you could do something else, that'd be great. And preferably food. Like, we really like food a lot. Um, but they were so focused on food that spoils while, while Jesus is talking about something that leads to eternal life. And I think for a lot of us, we are so focused on blessings that we miss out on what Jesus is really talking about is eternal life found in him, what he has for us, not just in the everyday blessings of life, but in the life that is to come. You see, the crowd wanted physical things, but Jesus was saying, and I love this, he's our fulfillment. He's everything. The Apostle Paul, or, or we, I'll get to that in a minute, but um, something we're going to say a lot in this series is Jesus isn't just good, but he, he, he's also necessary. When it comes to food and bread, you don't have to eat every day. Okay, you, you don't have to eat. And, and we're so blessed as a nation that we don't just eat every day, but we eat, uh, for most of us, we eat about three times a day, and then we have snacks in between the breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner. And then we also have, like, right before we go to bed, we have ice cream or some other snack. And so we eat way more than what's needed. And, and, and depending on your health, um, you can uh, go about 70 days without any food. 70 days. I mean, for me, I struggle going 70 minutes, but, but you can't go 70 days without food. And, and, and I, I think this is important. Too many of us don't fast from food, but we're more than willing to fast from Jesus. We're so willing to go, you know what? I, I, I'm okay to go 70 days without Jesus, like a, a spending time in the Word, spending time worshiping, spending all those kind of, I'm, I'm okay to go 70 days without Jesus, but there's no way I can go 70 days without food. And we're so consumed with food, we're so consumed with physical things that, that it's almost like we cannot have it, and, and it drives us crazy. And Jesus is sitting here waiting for us to look to him, and, and we, we so willingly fast. Jesus is asking us to consume. What does that mean? I think it's, it's an interesting word. Um, it means complete trust. To have this complete trust that he's going to be there for you, that he has something planned for you, that you're not just wandering around aimlessly. He has a plan. It means sustaining power, much like how bread can give us sustenance. He is our sustaining power. Consuming Jesus is also reading this thing called the Bible, having the word in your heart so you may not sin against him. It's, it's having those pieces in your life that you need. It's prayer, a communication with God, with the living God. It is connecting with him all the time on a daily basis. It's consuming him. We have plenty of reasons why we choose not to consume. Plenty of reasons. One is we focus on people and not Jesus. Um, we, we're so uh, set on making the right connections. You know, if you're at school, you want to make sure you make the right connection with that girl. You know, you're like, hello, you. You know, uh, maybe it's at work. You want to make sure you make the right connections with your boss. You want to get in good with them. So when he sees you, he knows who you are, but also knows you do good work. Um, we're so co committed to this connection with people around us and so not committed to connection with God. Secondly is because we become lazy. Um, we rely on the pastor to give us what we need for the week, and we think that's going to sustain us for the whole thing, for the next week, until the next week. But that's not how it works. For some of us, we take a break. Maybe uh, there's a season in life we're just busy, and it's, uh, maybe we have a young baby, and so it's just hard. We're, way, we're up you know, early. We're up you know, any time of the day. We're just up, and, and you know, we're told we're supposed to take a nap when they nap, and so we're not. And so like, maybe at the time, it's just really hard to do some of these things. 
But, but that break lasts months, and then for some of us it lasts years, and for maybe for some of us it lasts even longer than years, and we just take a break, and then we become lazy, and then it feels like we're off. Maybe for some of us we, we lose interest. Like we hear a message like this or another message, we're like, okay, I'm going to do this thing, and so I'm going to read the Bible from cover to cover, and I'm going I'm I'm to kill it. And so we start in Genesis, and Genesis is good with all the creation stories and all the beginning of everything. And so it's like, okay, I'm trucking along. And then we get to Exodus. We're like, it's, it's good. I like it. I like it. And then we get into some of the other ones, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then we're like, I don't even know what's going on. Like, and, and, and who begat who? And it's just like we kind of just lose interest. And we start off with so much gusto. And then now we're at this place of going, I don't even know what's going on. And, and so we just kind of lose interest. Maybe some things are taking place, like your job, you're just busy. Um, may, maybe it's, uh, uh, what else do I have? Is that maybe um, you just kind of go, you go to, you go to church, but, but you're just struggling a little bit. And you're like, I, I'm just kind of losing interest. Maybe if I just take a break here, a break here, a break here. And fourthly, and I think for a lot of us, we just don't know where to start. And the Bible has all of these books within a big book. It has 66 books. And where do I even start? Do I start in the Old Testament? Do I start in the New Testament? If I start in the New Testament, there are pieces in the Old Testament I'm going to miss out on. It's like, is it a prequel, sequel type of thing? Um, if I start in a book I don't understand. And, and so it, it's just, it can be really, really confusing. And so to help you in that, I think a great place to start is in the book of Mark. It's all about Jesus. And Mark is known for these one-liners. And, and, and so start in Mark. Also, set your mind on Christ. Set, say, Jesus, I, I need your help here. I need, I don't know where to start. Guide me to where I need to be. You see, when I peel back this story, I hear this word over and over again, trust. Jesus is asking if they really, really trust that he will give them all that they need. Now, the Apostle Paul um, he, he writes to uh, this church in this, in this place called Philippi. This is what he says in, in Philippians 4, verse 19. It says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Do you really believe that? As you're sitting here and you're listening, do you really believe that God will meet all of your needs? I think for a lot of us, like, we really want to believe it. We really are like, you know, I, I think mostly I believe that. Mostly I think he can kind of fulfill or, or be there for me and help me out along the way. But I got a lot of stuff I got to get done. And so we rely on our strength instead of trusting in him. I think we try. And we, we can justify anything, too, though. You know, I, I need to have a break sometimes in life uh, with the busyness of job and sports with my kids and all that kind of stuff. And so it can be very easy for me to kind of escape away in my home. I love baseball cards and I love sorting them. It's easy to just kind of escape away from that. And it's easy at 40 years old. I really enjoy video games even at 40. You can judge me. Um, but, but like I, I enjoy those kind of things and it's easy for me to justify, you know, if I just spend a little bit of money, I can, I can do what I want to do and and I can justify it because you know I need some alone time I need to just kind of digress from everything and we can justify it but I think that's the million dollar question though isn't it can God meet all of my needs that's the million dollar question so what is our need your need is this Jesus and only Jesus I was talking to one of my friends I was just kind of just talking about actually about this message and, you know, what are you thinking? How, you know, and, and he said, when I, when I brought up this point of all you need is Jesus. And he told me kind of a, kind of a story. He says, suppose, kind of like a parable, suppose um, somebody is like, you know, I, I don't have a job and I really need a job. And you talk to that person, you're like, well, why do you need a job? Well, I need to provide food for my family. Okay, why do you need to provide food for your family? Well, because, you know, if, if they don't eat, eventually they're going to starve. And it keeps on going down, then what, then what, then what? And it eventually comes down to, if you don't do this, then I'll die. And then he asked a pivotal question. Then what? Then I need Jesus. 
I need Jesus. The, the ultimate point is this need for Jesus because he not only meets all of our physical needs, but he meets us in our deepest of needs. Can you trust in Jesus? Even if you can't see the outcome working in your favor, can you trust in him? Can you trust in Jesus even if you lose each week or you feel like you lose each week, you feel like you lose each month, you feel like you lose each year, can you still trust in Jesus? And can you trust in Jesus even when it feels like all hope is lost? Can you trust in him? So the last thing I want to kind of draw our attention to is sifting, is sifting. Now there's, there's this break that's about to happen. Now, in, in uh, John 6, starting in verse 53, Jesus goes into some graphic detail about consuming him. So much so that he says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Now, remember, can you imagine being these people and you're hearing Jesus say he's the bread of life? And you're like, what? I thought manna and, you know, all this kind of stuff. You're kind of like, what's going on? And Jesus presses a little bit harder and he gets to the point and saying, you know, consume me. And you're like, what? what's going on? And then he says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. I think if I was there, I'd be like, you know what? Um, you know, things were good for a bit, but this is just getting a little too... I wouldn't say weird, just going to a whole new level. And, and listen to what he says here in John 6, verses 60 through 66. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching, who can accept it? This is hard teaching, who can accept this? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? What if you see him die and then ascend back up to heaven? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not even believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. 65. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. In verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. There are some verses in the Bible that is one of the saddest verses. that You can go, that's a sad verse. Man, that's depressing. That's hard to hear. And I think verse 66 in John 6 is one of those verses where people are hearing it and they turn their backs and they walk away. They turn their backs and they walk away. They're saying, you know, this is not only hard, but I, it's just too much, Jesus. They said, man, Jesus, this is, this is difficult to hear. And Jesus goes to that extreme of eat my flesh, drink my blood. Now here's the thing, Jesus wasn't about cannibalism, okay? I, I just want to let you know that, let you be aware. Jesus is not about cannibalism. He was talking about the spiritual aspects of consuming him. That it, too many of us as Christians, we put Jesus on this mantle of our life of, you know, he's my Sunday morning thing. I come to church for Sunday morning so I can hear something about Jesus and hopefully that gives me what I need for my week. But Jesus isn't a Sunday morning thing. He's not just a Sunday morning thing and then maybe you have a life group that meets sometime during the week and then, okay, I'll have that little piece and, and maybe you serve or help in some, some ways or another in the church or in the community or wherever. And it's like, I have a little piece on Sunday morning, have a little piece some other time during the week and then when I serve, I have a little piece. No, 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 Jesus wants you to, consumed your whole life and he wants you to consume him so it's like you guys are working together much like how food isn't meant to be looked at right i mean like we, we when, when we're at the store and we see food we want to just eat it because it's food right it, we're not supposed to just look at food or just kind of smell it but but we're supposed to eat it and consume it and the same is with Jesus. Jesus isn't something that we're supposed to just kind of do. He's supposed to be a part of us. He is the bread of life. But I think there's too many of us that are fans. 
There's way too many of us that are fans. Way too many of us are all about the social aspects of church. We're just about the gathering. We're just about being around kind of Christian people that are nice and kind and do well or whatever. And we're just about being fans. Now, and many of us are very faithful-ish. You know, we show up when we're supposed to or feel like we should kind of thing, and, and we do the things we're supposed to do. But as soon as it gets hard, as soon as maybe it gets uncomfortable, even uncomfortable to the point of somebody coming up to you and saying, hey, I think you'd be great for kids ministry. And you're like, nope, you know, kind of, I'm going to check out someplace else or I'm going to kind of look this way, act like I didn't hear it, you know. And so we're faithful-ish. We're faithful-ish like when maybe on a Sunday morning, Pastor Paul or Pastor Ed, Craig or Jason or even Drew or whoever talks about, you know, this month, Financially, it's been a little bit tougher. And, and so we're just asking you just to kind of give from the abundance of your heart. And you're like, you know what? This church just, I don't know if it's for me. You know, there's some other churches in the area. We should just check them out. And so we're faithful-ish. And even in our relationship with the Lord, it's like, you know, God wants me to have, like, have this connection with them all the time. I don't know if I want that. I still want to kind of do my thing. And so, you know, I'm faithful and until he asked me to do something. And the sad thing is there's very, very few of us that are actually followers, that we're actually following Jesus. And I think that's the sad thing in this story. If everything is gone, has he already done enough for you? If everything was stripped away, if everything that you were blessed with, all the manna that you received, if everything was stripped away, can you sit back and go, you know what? He's already done enough. He's taken my sin on the cross. If he never did anything else, he's done enough. I trust in him. I believe in him. You know, for me, I, I can't help but think back to those two men that blessed me. I, I cannot help but think that they were really following Jesus. They were really putting their faith and their trust. They were consuming Jesus. And the interesting thing is, is that they were the recipient of that trust. They were the recipient of how they trusted in Jesus by seeing the expression on my face, but also just being there working with Jesus. They were the recipient of that. And as the person that was blessed, I was the recipient of trusting as well by taking a step of faith Say, so, you know, I don't know what Des Moines is going to look like. I don't know what these six or so months apart from my fiance is going to look like. But I'm going to trust in Jesus that he's going to bless me. He's going to be there for me. He's going to sustain me. He's going to be the power that I need. So can you honestly sit back and say, you know what? I really do believe that he can give me all that, that he gives me everything I need. So are you a fan? Are, are you faithful-ish, or are you a real follower? So at this point, we're going to release to our campus pastors and, and have a great week, and hopefully we see you guys soon. Hey, guys, I want to go over some transformational moments with you, okay? So in your outline, who are you in this story? Who do you identify in this story, right? Are, are you the fan? Are you the people that were there for the miracle? You're there for, you know, the cool thing, the blessing that Jesus is going to do. Maybe you're there for the food, the fish sandwich. Are, are you the fan in this story? Because in your life, can you kind of look back and go, you know what? I think that I'm a fan. I, I think that I really like Jesus. There's things I like about him. There's things I wish I was more a part of. But I, I don't know. I'm just really here for the social. I'm really just here because... I want Jesus just to really bless me. Can you actually look back, peel back, do a little perspective of your life? And can you say, you know what, I think that I'm actually a fan. Maybe, maybe do you identify as the faithful-ish? You know, you're, you're faithful, you're in the game until it gets a little uncomfortable, until you're asked to do something you really don't want to do, until you're asked to give and you're like, you know what, money's tight and you know, somebody else can do that. 
Or you ask when somebody says, hey, I'd love for you to serve. I'd love for you to step out of your comfort zone. I'd love for you to do this. You're like, you know what? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just don't know. Or, or in the story, are you that faithful-ish crowd that followed and, and, and then, you know, you're there. And Jesus said some hard things. And said, you know, this is a hard teaching. And then when he says, you know, eat my flesh, drink my blood, you're like, you know what? You know, are you in that group? Are you looking at Jesus in a, in, in a way that's not what he's actually saying? Are, are you really just there because you get something and you're part of the crowd, you're a little more into the game than the fans? Are you faithful-ish? Or are you in this last camp of are you a follower? Are you a true follower where it's only about Jesus and always been about Jesus? Are you a follower that when he says go, you're willing to go? And when somebody taps you on the shoulder, that you're willing to step out of your comfort zone and say, you know what, I've never done it, but I'm willing to try. Uh, you know what, if Jesus is leading me there, I, I'm, I'm going to go. He's already gone before me, so I'm going to trust that he's there. It's not just me doing it. That he's there with me every step of the way. So I want to pray for you as we kind of make this transition. But I, I, I want to pray for you that if you're a fan or if you are faithful-ish, that you can get to the place where you can really say, you know what, I am a follower of Jesus. So Jesus, I pray for um, everyone watching this video, for everyone that's in this room right now, that you help them make those steps to get from a fan or to a faithful-ish person to a follower that trusts in you all the way, that they're not just looking for the blessings and you give blessings upon us, much like how a father blesses his son, you bless us. So, so you give us those blessings, you give us that manna, but it's not about that. It's about this trust to know that you're with us, you're guiding us, and you're walking beside us every step of the way. Help us to get to that place to know that you're here, but you're also ahead that you love us. Help us to get to that place to know and trust that not only do you do those things, but you did the ultimate thing, and you sacrificed for us, that you put our sins, our iniquities, our shortcomings on you so that we could have a relationship with your Father in heaven. So help us to get to that place to, to trust all the way, to consume you with our heart, souls, and mind, to know that you love us, you died for us, and you sustain us. Thank you for you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.